John, it is really a pleasure coming to UCLA. This is where I got my doctorate in at the Brain Research Institute uh, many years ago. And uh, uh, even though I have gone on to do other things in life, uh, I have always had a passion, indeed an obsession, to understand consciousness, the brain, the mind, all of those wonderful things we talk about as high school or college sophomores. And some of us, it never leaves, that sense of awe and wonder. And as I've begun to talk to cosmologists, philosophers of mind, I, I, there is really a need to ground what we talk about in understanding consciousness in terms of the brain, in terms of what we really have. So we've been talking to anatomists, physiologists, I come to you with the new technologies of imaging to understand what they are and how they can help us understand what the brain and what the mind is all about. Well, first of all, welcome home. Thank you. I mean, I think it's great that you've come back and that you're doing this work because I think it's um, exciting and important, and we look forward to it. Uh, now that you're home, <laughs> you can see things have changed a little since you left, and uh, imaging is what I've been doing for 20 years, and only brain imaging. And the tools that we have today really have unique capabilities in terms of showing us the anatomy of the brain or the structure and the function of the brain. And while they're still crude, because what we see are millions of cells and hundreds of millions of connections, it's still a window that wasn't there before. And we can do these studies in normal people, we can do them in patients, and we can do them over and over again. So we can see how things change over time, how things change from moment to moment. And so really it is a very exciting time because we have this advantage of a perspective into the normal structure and function of the human brain. So let's just describe how it works simply. How can imaging tell us about brain function? Well, first we have to understand brain structure. And the anatomists have done a great job right. of uh, looking at all the little parts in the machine. But there's so many of them that you can't really grasp that, and no one's been able to make a model of the complexity at a level that really represents the brain. And various models that talk about computers and other things are probably woefully inadequate and simplistic compared to what's required for an organ to be able to manage the infinite repertoire of human behaviors that a lifetime will deal out. Yeah. So uh, we start with the structure. And when we, uh, when we deal with structure in terms of imaging, we're talking about structure that goes down to about a cubic millimeter. So a very small area uh, in terms of the overall size of the brain, but a vast area in terms of the machinery in that little right. cubic millimeter. And um, immediately there's a problem. And the problem is that the structure of everyone's brain is different. So if we go back to the anatomists, the, the great brain anatomists of the early part of the last century, some of them spent a lifetime studying a single brain yeah. and produced maps of the cellular architecture throughout parts of the brain. They were named. These maps are still used. And they're vital for understanding how the landscape is divided up in terms of its structure. But what didn't come from that is the fact that that structure is different in every person. It's even different probably between twins. And so one of the first obstacles that large-scale brain imaging research met was having to deal with the variability among individuals. And so we spent a lot of time, 14 years, mm. making collections of hundreds and then thousands of normal people. Normal, of course, is a committee decision. There's no hard, fast rules for normal. But within that framework of a definition, trying to define the variability among people so that we could then have the proper complexity to layer function on top of it. So that's the first step. Okay, so we have 
the structure and getting the, the normal population so that you can then have a, a, a generalized map that you have some confidence in. Now, how, how do you begin to relate that map of different structure with one millimeter resolution capability to uh, a- actual different brain functions under different conditions? So let's talk about what we mean by function for a minute. In most brain imaging studies, we use as a surrogate marker of function changes in blood flow. So when cells fire at a higher rate, the blood flow to those cells increases. When they fire at a lower rate, the opposite occurs. Now, that's an indirect way of looking at what we'd like to see, the firing, the electrical firing of individual cells. And both can be meaningful, turning on or turning off. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So we would love to look at that. We can't. We don't have a technology that allows us to look at the firing of cells. So we look at the indirect aspect of the energy utilization or the fuel supply to deliver that energy to regions of the brain. And that has problems in that it's it's um, not the same. It may exaggerate or underestimate what's going on. But it does give a reasonably reliable indication of where something is different. But we're taking a uh, multi-billion cell engine and we're looking at the gas gauge, yeah. <laughs> you know, in various parts and how much fuel is being delivered. So with that caveat, uh, one can look at changes in blood flow as an indirect measure of brain function. With other tools, like PET scanners, one can look at more molecular events, specifically receptors in the brain, chemical behavior, the delivery of drugs, where they go, where they bind in the brain, when they leave. So function can have many different components to it, but probably the one that most people use is this indirect measure of blood flow. 